We are people and we love to get connected. We connect as families because of birth. We connect as friends because we click. And we connect as communities because we care. Seventh-day Adventists are people who connect in communities called congregations, which in turn connect to form conferences, who connect together to form unions, divisions, and the general conference. Why do we connect? It starts with a connection to the Creator who invites us on a spiritual journey. When we journey together, we can help each other along the way. This journey is a journey of a lifetime. And as we learn and grow, life becomes filled with meaning and purpose. Our greatest joy is in helping others along the way. Wherever you are on your journey, we believe that we have something to offer that can make your life more whole. So the next time you see a Seventh-day Adventist, remember, you're not looking at someone who stands alone. They are connected to a world church that has 18 million members gathered in 13 divisions comprised of 122 unions formed by 600 conferences serving in 140,000 congregations in 208 countries who worship in 924 languages and they all want to connect with you. Dubai, we'll show you around, and uh, until my next meeting, which is in uh, Montenegro in Europe. And uh, there, uh, at the camp meeting, I know the Hams. We were together at some missionary training uh, this summer, and I said, hey, why not swing by Oman? Yes, and Oman is a just a mysterious country. Who lives in Oman? The Omani live in Oman. Uh, but also, God has people in Oman, yes, and I'm like, I'd like to meet these mysterious people and uh, you're not so mysterious at all you're wonderful people and it's a privilege that uh, you have come out this evening uh, I work at the general conference and I am just this year was voted to be the editor for Adventist World and Adventist Review magazines in 1840 guess which year 40 Four, no, incorrect. Adventists always give the answer 1844, which is the answer to all the prof prophecies. But in 1849, in 1849, I should say in 1848, Ellen White received the vision. She received the vision and she told her husband, husband, start a magazine. It will be very small in the beginning, but with whatever means you have, it'll get bigger and bigger. And she said, it'll become like streams of light that go to the whole world. Now, you gotta imagine that back then, the Adventist church was very small, very poor, very young, 21, 23, 17, 12 years old. But they had the audacity to say, let's go do something for the whole world. And in, 19, in 1849, one year later, they started with a magazine, and it was known as Present Truth. It has existed all the way till now, and today, the current magazine is entitled Adventist Review. The Adventist Review and Adventist World magazines, they try to unite God's people all around the world. So whether you are from uh, Bangalore or Tokyo or Musket, or from South America, North America, all around the world, it tries to unite. Uh, unite God's people uh, wherever they are at. And so even here in Oman, uh, the General Conference greets you, acknowledges you, and praise the Lord for your individual and personal ministries and uh, the struggle that many of you are having while living in this country and living, have a, uh, to make a living, but also being Christians in a, in a wonderful, beautiful country, but a very unique context. My understanding is also that uh, Elder Ted Wilson visited uh, Oman a couple years ago. Is that correct? Were you around then? Some of you were there. Uh, he and I attend the same church, and uh, we, we used to teach Sabbath school together. And one day he said, I came back from Oman. 
And man, is it one of the most cleanest and most beautiful cities in the world that he's visited. Uh, if you know Elder Wilson, the president of our world church, out of 365 days in the year, he travels 300, visiting all the churches in the world. And he said, he said that uh, Muscat was one of the best cities he's been to. And I'm, I'm, upon arriving this morning, I saw the streets, and it's just, you have a very, very beautiful city. And I want to say thank you for the invitation, thank you for the privilege, and thank you for coming out on a Wednesday in the midweek. You are part of the 144,000 who come to church on not only on Saturday, not only on Friday, but on a Wednesday. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless each one of you. Uh, tonight, I'd like to start off our two-day revival week, uh, week series in the book of Luke chapter 13. If you have your Bibles, please turn them on or turn to the book of Luke. Luke is the third book of the New Testament. Chapter 13 is the 13th chapter after chapter 12 in most translations that I'm aware of. And if you're there, please say amen. amen. If you're not there, please say wait for me. Okay. If you're not there, uh, you need to go there quickly because you're making the sermon very long. Okay, we're waiting for you. Uh, before we read scripture, I know we prayed, but I'm going to ask you to bow your heads just one more time as we read Holy Scripture. Gracious Father, your people have gathered in this house. They have not come here to listen to a speaker from abroad. They have come here to hear from you. And so, Father, we ask for your Holy Spirit, not because we deserve, not because we are good, but because of the blood of Jesus and because of the promise of Jesus, we ask simply for the Holy Spirit. And as we read these words, we ask that you bless us in ways that only you can bless. Speak to each one of my brothers in this room, each one of my sisters in this room, each to, to each of us individually, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter 13, the Bible says, there were present at that season some that had told them of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Jesus answering said to them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Every generation has one iconic news event that the entire generation remembers. For some of you who are older, you may have remembered when the American President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. If you remember that, you, you can just nod. You don't have to raise your hand because it reveals something about your age. Uh, but this was something that the whole world was really uh, shocked about. Maybe it was the assassination of Martin Luther King. At least from where I come from in North America, these two assassinations were, were just groundbreaking. Maybe you are of the generation that was even older that remember the bombing of Pearl Harbor that started, that was part of the world wars that happened a long time ago. If you're of this generation, you can nod and say that you remember. Maybe you remember when the Berlin Wall fell down in the late 80s and the USSR disassembled itself. Maybe you will remember. There are some of you who remember that in 2001, September 11, that the Twin Towers fell down. And in these iconic events, the people always ask yourself, where were you when it happened? Well, I was you know, taking a shower and I heard it on the radio. I was driving, I was walking to class and I heard it. There is now a whole generation that does not even know about 9-11. Can you believe it? There's these young people and they read about 9-11 from the history books. Meaning young people were born after 9-11. Amazing. You know you're getting old when you think of these events as history. Without a doubt, there is a current generation that the greatest event in their lifetime was the COVID pandemic. And you'll always, from this point on, you will grow up and uh, uh, go to other people and say, what were you doing for three years during the pandemic? And you will tell these young people, I did nothing. I sat in front of a, 
computer, and we played this program called Zoom. And people went, what is this Zoom? And then you tell them, it is this ancient program where we stared at a screen for 24 hours. After these global events, we have become addicted to breaking news. Maybe you watch CNN, or maybe BBC, or Al Jazeera, whatever your news event is, you get addicted to breaking news. Currently, there's something going on in breaking news. What is it? There is a war going on just a couple of hours, either that way or that, I don't know where we are, but somewhere over here, on one direction, Gaza and Israel are engaged in a war that potentially can affect the entire region, if not the whole war. What would Jesus say if he were alive today? Well, he still is alive, but if he was on this earth today, I should say, what would he say if he were standing here? Say, Jesus, Jesus, can you please comment on the war in Israel or Gaza? There will be some people that would want Jesus to comment on the side of Gaza. The smaller group, the one who has been, you know, had all the political uh, association with the Palestinians. There will be another group that will be signing on the side of Israel and they would want Jesus to talk about Israel. After all, He is the living incarnation of Israel. Yes. What would Jesus say? How would Jesus deal with breaking news? If you look here in Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, there were present at that season, there were these Galileans, and their blood was mingled because the governor, a political leader, came into the Galilean temple and killed these people while in service. This was an injustice. The government came in and they were killing them in the middle of worship. And then they asked him, Jesus, Jesus, please comment on this. This is CNN breaking news. Al Jazeera breaking news. These people have died. Jesus, please comment. And what does Jesus say? Verse 2. Do you think that these Galileans were sinners above all of the other Galileans? Meaning, the question is this. The people that died, were they more sinful than everyone else? That God caused them to die. Were they? Question. The people who died in the pandemic in Indonesia, were they more sinful than all the other people that, they, that God allowed them to die? No. Another question. As all of you have come here to this church tonight, there's, there are some people who are in a car accident in Muscat and they died. Were they more sinful than you that God allowed them to get in a car accident and die? 9-11, the Twin Towers, the Twin Towers fell. About 3,000 people died. Were they more sinful than all the other people in New York that God told them, God allowed them to die? Jesus' answer in verse 3, it says, I tell you what? What does He say? No, but except you repent, you shall also likewise perish. What is Jesus saying here? This talks about these, these uh, political news, and how would Jesus answer them? And uh, let's go to another, another breaking news. Verse 4. Verse 4. Those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, do you think that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? Apparently, there was a tower in Siloam. 18 people were there. And because the building was made in, in, in China, because of uh, not quality materials, it fell down and all 18 people died. Were they more sinful than everyone else? Today I was privileged with Pastor Ham to visit Muscat and we visited, I forgot the name of the tower, uh, Mutafa Tower, yes? And it was built by the Portuguese in the 1500s, made by stone. And if the two of us were there walking around and all of a sudden the tower and then we die. Is it because the two of us were more sinful than all of you that God allowed this to happen? I ask this question because Jesus asked this question twice and He answers twice. Verse 5, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall also likewise perish. 
There were, was a tsunami, or was it the Gaza in Israel, or whether it's 9 11, or whatever natural disaster. Why do bad things happen? And when we hear the news, how should we respond? It is a temptation, and for, for, for some of you, including myself, it is a temptation to think if bad things happen to you, it's because God caused it to happen. How many of you have this temptation? You, uh, 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 this, is, uh, this is my mother-in-law. This is my wife's mother. She said, I've gone to church all my life, but sometimes when bad things happen, sometimes I can't help but think, maybe God is trying to teach me something, and God caused it to happen. I call it pagan thinking. And for those of you who have come from backgrounds where you have other pagan religions, maybe it's Buddhism or uh, Hinduism or all the isms out there, this is a temptation to think. So my mother-in-law, she had made a, 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 a fruit smoothie with a, with a blender, yes? And she made it on Sabbath. And she put it there in the, on the kitchen sink. And my father-in-law came and then he was, he was cleaning it. Yes? And by cleaning it, he all of a sudden, there was uh, some knives there, and his finger, whoosh, and they cut the tip off. And they went to the doctor, and, and, and he's fine. He, you know, he's still alive today, yes? But what happened was my, my mother-in-law was thinking, hmm, that was on Sabbath. And we shouldn't work on Sabbath. Maybe, do you think God caused this to happen? And it's a temptation to think, because we are petty, sometimes we take our pettiness and we think that God is also petty. Yes. How many of you ever lost your keys, or lost your wallet, or lost your phone? One time I lost my keys and I found it in the refrigerator. I don't know how it got there and I don't know what it was there for. But this is what happens. If you're laughing, you're laughing because this happened to you. When you lose something, what do you do? You look around the normal places where you lose something. At stage one, yes. But when you look there, it's not there. Then you start looking and you're like, okay. Then you start looking in places like maybe it fell. These unconventional places. Okay, maybe here, maybe there, maybe there. You start walking. And then it's not there. Then after you look everywhere, you start panicking a little bit. But then your rational brain says, no, 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 don't panic. It's got to be here something. It's got to be here somewhere. And usually your wife says, where was the last place you saw it? Well, if you know the last place you saw it, you'd know where it was. But your wife and her spouse is always asking a very commonsensical question of which you do not know the answer. To. And then you start looking, 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 looking. And then when you cannot find it, you start going back to the first places again. Yes or no? Maybe you went too quickly. And so you search one more time. And you look and you look and you look. And then you start panicking. And when you panic, you start thinking, where's my phone? My phone is very expensive. Where's my keys? If I don't have my keys, I cannot go to work. If I don't have my wallet, someone stole my wallet. And then you start getting into irrational thinking. One time I saw someone walking their dog in front of my house. And I lost my wallet. And I thought, he stole my wallet. He came into my house, he stole my wallet. Now he's pretending to walk his dog to look innocent. It wasn't until I went to the refrigerator that I found all these things. Apparently I was so busy that I put these things in there, got some water, closed it, and I lost my stuff. But while I was thinking, while I lost my, my wallet, my keys, my, my, my phone, I did this. Lord, is it because of my sins that you have caused me to lose my wallet? Is that irrational thinking? So you start doing this, you get on your knees, Lord, forgive me for all my sins. And say, Lord, help me to find my lost. How many of you have ever prayed like that? Be honest. Yes? Some of you, if you're laughing, you, 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 you've done this. <laughs> Irrational. Yes or no? Yes. And then once you meet, you, once you find your keys, you're like, praise the Lord Jesus Almighty on high. You can create the world in seven days and you help me find my keys. No. You were just foolish to lose your keys and now you found them again. It is a temptation to think like a pagan. Bad stuff, stuff happens to bad people, therefore we think that good stuff must happen to good people. Is that true? It's not true. The Bible says that the sun and the rain fall on the wicked and the just and the unjust. 
But the pagan thinking is, if that person is suffering, they must be unrighteous. If this person is blessed, that because God is happy with that person. That is simplistic pagan thinking. In 1 Kings 17 and 18, this woman, when she, once her son was sick, she said to the man of God, Are you come to remember my sins upon me? Yes, you remember that story. In Matthew 45, Jesus says, however, that God makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. So the question is this, this is the question for tonight. What should be our reaction to the suffering of others? If you see Koreans do this, when Koreans see someone suffering, they say, how many of you do something like that? We say, that person, they're probably bad, something bad, they did in their heart secretly, that's why God caused this to happen. They do this, how many of you do you want to talk about? Yeah. Some countries do that. I don't know. Jesus then tells a story. He tells what everyone? Story. story. Verse 6. This is a story set in a vineyard with a fig tree. Verse 6. Jesus spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He came and he sought fruit thereon and found nothing. Question. What did this man plant? He planted a? fig tree in a what? In a vineyard. What is a vineyard? What fruit is grown in a vineyard? Great. Question. Why plant a fig tree in the midst of grapes? For example, I say, hey, you are now my friends. Come visit my house. This is my tomato garden. But in the middle, there is a cucumber plant. Does it make sense? Why in the midst of a grape vineyard is there a fig tree? Many of you have become urbanized muscatites. Is that what you call people from Muscat? Muscatiers. Are you serious? <laughs> Musketeers. I shall revise my sermon. You have all become urban mus musketeers. Planters often mix two kinds of species together because one species takes all one kind of nutrient out. If they put another plant that complements it, they call it a symbiotic relationship, it'll put those nutrients in that the other one takes out, and the other one that puts in, you understand this relationship together. Sometimes there is nutritional symbiosis. Sometimes there is aesthetic symbiosis, meaning the fig tree provides shade for the, the, the grapes, especially in a desert culture. You understand why that would be very important. Or sometimes a predatorial symbiosis, meaning the fig tree is bigger and has these figs that go out. The birds will come and they will eat the figs, but they will not eat the grapes. We do not know the relationship, but there was a relationship between the two. The fig tree was planted in the middle of the grapes. Israel was receiving the blessings of God, but it did not bless the nations around it. It was just taking nutrition from the ground, and it forgot its original purpose, its identity, design, and function. Why this fig tree was there? The fig tree says, I don't care why I am here. I am just going to take the nutrition out of it. And did it provide fruit? No, it did not have fruit. Do you know of instances of those who have forgotten their original purpose because of the affluence and blessings around them? If I can be very frank with you, I know today is one of two nights, but can I be open and frank with you? I am a son of two immigrants, two Koreans who left their country, they came to the United States, and I was born in America. In one culture, I was Korean. In another culture, I was American. In conclusion, I am confused. Yes? <laughs> 
Many of you left your country. You came to another country. Do you know that immigrants are one of the craziest people in the world? You need diligence and fortitude and a certain level of insanity to leave behind your mother country, mother tongue, mother people, mother village, and come to a new country where people, they might not even like you. You don't have enough opportunity and you have to brave through the elements New weather, new food, new language, new people. And then your children are raised in this group. And then your children are new. Yes, because they're not of your culture. They're not of this culture. They are what? Confused. Yes, we call that third culture children. But after being around in a new environment for a long time, many immigrants forget the original identity and purpose and reason why God had sent them to begin with. Rather than being suns that give forth light, many degenerate into black holes that suck even the light around them. This fig tree had a purpose to bless the vineyard around it. But the fig tree said no. I have worked here too hard and these grapes don't even like me. They won't even give me a visa. They won't even give me citizenship here. So I'm just going to take what I need to get until I get enough and I'm not going to bless those around me. Immigrants who come to a new country to get an education for themselves or their children or perhaps help their family back home, but they forget their spiritual purpose and identity and mission as Seventh-day Adventists, and they end up building themselves up and looking more wealthier than they really are. Perhaps you are a student who has gone to university to become a successful professional, to be an excellent Seventh-day Adventist Christian, to, to uh, uh, win uh, the, the best accolades of academia. But well, while there you have forgotten your purpose and you've forgotten the sacrifice of your parents and your teachers and you get involved with the wrong crowd, with the wrong substances, wrong liquids, and you produce no fruit. Maybe you are parents who decided to raise godly Seventh-day Adventist children, but you have to work now six days a week and the bills and the finances get too much. And now there's too much stress. And now you are justified in being entertained because of the stress that you get. And now you raise your children half-heartedly and there is no fruit. Maybe you are a pastor who you originally wanted to go to ministry to save souls, but you forget your calling and you see the world around you. You get discouraged with the politics and organization and the people playing games and you lose your calling to cynicism, bitterness, contempt, and you have no fruit. Maybe you are retired and you started your life strong with faith. And you were a steward and you had sacrifice, but you ended your career with questionable practices and now you've lost your integrity altogether just to live out your retirement years and with no fruit. Question, what is this fruit? The Bible says fruit is two definitions. One, it is other souls to the kingdom of God. Yes? And we know that in a, in, a, in a limited context such as this, souls means different things, yes? But using, having our evangelistic witness to those around us in our schools, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods. But fruit also means the, the characteristics of Jesus, the fruit of the Spirit, love, kindness, gentleness, faith, meekness, gentle, all these things. The question is this, where are you in your faith tonight, brothers and sisters? Have you lost the original purpose to be a blessing to those around you? Or are you just there and producing no fruit? Verse 7, the Bible says, Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find... What does the Bible say? None. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? While fruit may not appear the first year, maybe not the second year, but usually by three years, fruit is produced. 
Question. We spent three years in the pandemic. What, did, what fruit did you produce during the pandemic? Isaac Newton, he discovered gravity, optics, and calculus during the bubonic plague where he was in quarantine in his house all by himself. Yes? How many of you have discovered calculus or gravity in your homes during the pandemic? Shakespeare, during the pandemic, he, he also experienced quarantine pandemic, he wrote King Lear, Macbeth, and Anthony and Cleopatra. What did you write during the pandemic? Many more emails, I'm sure. Mary Shelley, in 1816, there was a volcanic explosion, and everyone was quarantined to stay inside the house. And she wrote the book Frankenstein, about the, you know, the monster. How many of you have written the book Frankenstein during the pandemic? We do not discover theories or novels as disciples of Jesus. Instead, during the three years of the pandemic, how many of you have produced the characteristic fruits of Jesus? Or how many of you have won souls to the kingdom in some capacity? Or have you just been in your vineyard and produced no fruit. After three years, this gardener says, cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? It just takes, 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 and it doesn't give at all. What does the Bible say? Verse 8, And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, meaning one more year, let it alone, until I shall dig about it, and I shall, what? The King James Version, I like. The New King James says, until I fertilize it. The King James says, until I dung it. Until I what, everyone? Dung. Do you know what dung is? Dung is? Dung. Verse 9. If it bear fruit, well. If it not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. And this is one of the few parables where Jesus does not give the end conclusion to the story. Meaning, the person, all of us who are listening, has the option to decide how this prayer, uh, par parable ends. Jesus says, let it alone. And so God the Father says, these people are selfish. I bless them, and they do not produce fruit. There's no evangelism. There's no, there's not, they're not becoming more like Jesus. They're becoming less like Jesus. Just cut it down. And in between, the mercy of God comes in. Intercedes. No, 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 no. Justice, wait one year. And in one year of mercy, under the hands of a master gardener. What kind of gardener? Master gardener. Jesus knows what he's doing. Amen? He's very good at it. He's going to do two things. I will dig about it, and I will dung it. Two things. Dig and dung. During the pandemic, my wife, she wanted to grow non-GMO, healthy, organic tomatoes. We spent thousands of dollars on dirt and and then garden and all this, you know, watering system. And for three years, we've been we've been trying to grow. We only had like five tomatoes that came out. These are the most expensive tomatoes I've eaten in my life. They're the healthiest and the smallest tomatoes and the most expensive. Don't tell my wife that, please. She might, uh, she might not like it. But in this garden, I remember that the, the, the ground was very compacted. For those of you who have been living here in, in Oman for too long, you see the sandy, the sandy the ground you don't understand. But in North America, there's some, some ground that's just very, very hard. So the more you put water in it, the water doesn't go down to the ground. It just stays right on top. Kind of like your rainy season. There's nowhere for the, world, the water to go. Yes. So we bought this thing called the claw. Yes. It is on the bottom. It looks like this. It's a long stick. And you take this stick and you stomp it into the ground and then you twist it. You pull it out, stomp it, and you twist it. And what happens is the ground is dug up 
holes are created, and then the soil becomes nice and and um, I don't know what this is like nice and soft, nice and soft. That's not the only work that Jesus does. It's painful, but Jesus needs to put it in, twist, and cause openings in your life. Because unless He does that, sometimes we just harden ourselves up to earth's reality and the sufferings around us. We don't want to be hurt again. Sometimes Jesus causes this opening, softening up of our lives. But the second thing is, He puts there what? Fertilizer. How many of you have ever bought fertilizer? Maybe you go to the store and say, excuse me, sir, can I have some fertilizer? And they have a little bag that says fertilizer. You just open it and you sprinkle it. That's not fertilizer. That's not biblical fertilizer. Biblical fertilizer is dung. What is dung? In an animal culture, uh, animals walk by and they leave behind dung. Poo-poo. Smelly. Nasty. But it's exactly what the soil needs. And sometimes, God allows, you'll forgive me, poo-poo experiences in your life. <laughs> Amen? Amen? We don't like it. We don't like the smell. We don't like the look. But God allows it under the hands of a master guard. He's not malicious. He's not vindictive. He's not angry. He just says, I just want you to produce fruit. So under the hands of a master gardener, he digs and he allows poo-poo to go in and he mixes it together and he waits for one year for there to produce fruit. When I was young, my parents sent me to Korea for me to learn my mother language, my, my mother tongue, and uh, she, she sent me to my uncle's house. My uncle lived deep into the nowhere of Korea. We went deep into the, the mountain top, mountain down the valley, deep into the valley woods, and the road disappeared, and we were like, you know, in this car, and no electricity. And we were in the middle of nowhere. I'm like, wow, we are in the middle of nowhere, Korea. And I said, my uncle said, this is the, the room, this is the kitchen, this is the living room, okay? There's no electricity. So when the sun goes down, you go down. When the sun comes up, you go up. Okay, that's fine. Uncle, where is the bathroom? Ah, nephew, come here. Come here. Look over there. Yeah? Look far down the valley. Yes? What do you see? I see, uh, there's kind of a pink curtain, pink round curtain. Yes, that is the bathroom. What? So I went down there and it was a, I'm sorry, but kind of looked like this pulpit. There's a wooden, wooden step here. You kind of go up and there's a curtain all around and you open the curtain and in there, there's a hole. Yes? Now, if you're laughing, it means that you know what, I, what I'm talking about, yes? <laughs> and there's two wooden planks that cross the hole. They're very thin. And one for my left foot, one for the right foot, and you walk. And one miscalculation will result in your death. And then, you know, you squat and you do your thing and you come out. Yeah, that's, that's whatever. But I remember looking down and I saw demons inside the abyss. Things there that I did not know existed on earth. And I remember for two months, I refused to eat solid food. You know, I'm sorry to say this, but liquid food is liquid. But solid food... Solid. And so I did. I had lost so much weight that my uncle got so so worried that we had to drive back to the village, and we made a phone international phone call to my mother.
And my uncle saying to, to her, Sister, your son is not eating any of our food. Please talk to him. And then I was talking to my mother, Hey, why are you not eating food? Why? I don't want any food. Why? Why? I don't want any food. I food. There's monsters in the bathroom. I lost a lot of weight. Towards the end of the summer, I saw my aunt. And she took out some gloves. But these were the Korean pink gloves that come down all the way down to the shoulder. And then she put on, you know, a mask and a, you know, a hazmat suit it looked like. And I said, Auntie, Auntie, where are you going? Oh, no, no, Justin, stay inside. No, Auntie, where are you going? I want to see you. You stay inside. So in the window, I'm looking what she's doing. And she goes down the valley to the hole. And she opens the curtain, a pink curtain with pink gloves. That's why I don't like the color pink. <laughs> and in this wooden contraption, she opens the door and she pulls out a pink tub, big tub, which is inside this thing. And she pours it all out. All the, you know, mm -hmm, all, it's all coming out, the monsters. And she puts chemicals in there and grass and more dirt and she's mixing it with a stick mixing mixing and i'm like what is she doing now you understand korea now is a industrialized developed educated sophisticated country yes yes now you go there there are robots who are doing everything flying cars and you know holograms who say welcome to korea but in the, de the developing part of the world, in some parts in America, some parts in Korea, and maybe in some of your own countries as well. The people who live in the middle of nowhere, they make use of everything. Yes? Ev everything. Everything. So she's mixing and mixing and mixing and mixing. Crops. And she poured it all over this particular part of ground. I said, Auntie, why are you doing that? Oh, I'm trying to grow this, but it's not growing. It needs some nutrition, and I know what I'm doing. And then she, she's growing, and, and she's, she's it's just nasty. Before I left for, for America, the last day, we had a big feast. This is many weeks later, a big feast. And then I was eating zucchini, Korean zucchini, that was chopped in half uh, in slices and put with a little bit of egg and flour and, and then these, this Korean uh, delicacy. And I was like, you know, man, Auntie, this is so good. Where did we get the zucchini squash? We never had it before. Where did you get it? Oh, it's from that field. Oh, that. <laughs> that field? The field that didn't grow anything? Yes. I gave it special treatment. And now big squash came out. Big zucchini came out. That's, that's where you did the... Yeah. Oh. So even today, every time I see squash, zucchini, I think of my aunt. Even today. The whole point is this, this is a funny story. But does Jesus know what he's doing? Is he a master gardener? And so he will dig around our hearts and he will put fertilizer in our hearts, dung in our hearts, to cause us to grow fruit. So that when we see disasters or tsunamis or wars, Let's not judge them, yes? That's not our business. Our job is like, man, some of those people, they've lost their lives. 2,000 people, 1,000 people in Gaza and in Israel, they've died. Their lives were cut short. I don't know why. It's not because they were more sinful. It's not because they were righteous. I just need to repent now because that easily could have been me. So Lord, forgive me for these three years for not having been selfish. I'm so sorry. It's not that God is saying, you must now make fruit. We cannot make fruit of ourselves. We cannot do it. Yes? We merely have to say, Lord, dig around me and dung me, and I will produce fruit naturally for you.
Amen? Amen. Brothers and sisters, how many of you today want to say, Lord, I have a hard heart. Dig around me. I have a malnourished heart. Dung me. How many of you said your prayer? Please raise your hands. Now, brother, do you know what you're asking for? You're asking for a smelly, stinky, nasty experiences in your life. But it's exactly what you need for fruit from Jesus. Amen? Amen. Stand with me. Let us pray together. Let's pray. Gracious Father, for each pan that has risen, we ask for a dunging and digging experience. Father, forgive us for no fruit. We want lots of fruit for you, whether they be souls for the kingdom or the fruit of Jesus, the fruit of the Spirit. Help us, we pray. Help each. My brother and sister has risen their hand. Bless us. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, let everyone say it. Amen. Amen. Be seated.